Luke chapter 24. I want to speak from this idea, nailed it, nailed it. We're going to read verses 1 through 12, 1 through 12 in Luke 24. And it is customary here, we do stand and read the words. If you're physically able, would you stand with me as we read God's word? I'm going to pray for you, you pray for me, and we will see what the Lord has for us this morning. And we do read out loud together, reading from the CSB version of Scripture. Read along with me if you can. This is the word of God. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. Keep going. They were perplexed. Dazzling clothes. Are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Mary, the mother of James, and the, what's on the apostles to these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful that we get to celebrate the reality that the tomb is empty. Uh, for you reign supreme, Father God, at the right hand of the Father, and we get to honor and praise God because you defeated death, we have life. Because you defeated the grave, hell, sin no longer has reign over us. For you are our supreme Savior, our King, our Messiah, our prophet, our priest. You are our Father, and we are grateful that we are secured, we are redeemed, and we are accepted at the foot of the cross. And so, Jesus, as we celebrate the beautiful reality of the resurrection and what it means to us, Lord, set me aside. Move me out the way. Use me as a willing vessel for who you are. God, we're grateful and thankful. God, if there's anyone that does not know you, I pray we've made such a big deal about who you are, God that you would throw your weight around in this place, Father God, that the Spirit would be tangible, Lord, that you would draw people to yourself, Father, that do not know you. But but some people believe in you, but they, their faith has been wrecked by experiences and hurt. And God, would you restore hope and compassion to them today, Father God, because the empty tomb reminds us that we are never without hope. So, Father, let me honor you well in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people say amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen. If you have ever watched a game or so, so, I'm so, some, some sort of sports competition, you have heard the phrase, nailed it. A gymnast, when she sticks a perfect landing, the announcer will say, she nailed it. A golfer, if he hits a hole in one, you will hear the phrase, he nailed it. A basketball player, if he makes the game-winning shot, especially from half court, the sports, the play-by-play -play announcers will say, he nailed it. But it also goes beyond sports. If you go in on an interview and you make eye contact and you shake hands and you let them know that you'll be a great team player, you can nail that interview. If I got any cooks in the room, sometimes some people can nail a recipe and have people wanting to come back for seconds and thirds and some of y'all fourths if they nail it. Or if you have an exam, if you're trying to get that insurance license or you're trying to pass the bar and you pass and you are looking in the mirror and saying, I nailed it. When someone nails it, essentially what we're saying is they did something flawlessly. 
The Bible presents us that Jesus nailed it for our lives and for our redemption. Jesus stuck the perfect landing for us. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says it this way, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. I want to submit to you today that, that Jesus didn't quite nail it on the cross. He nailed it in the resurrection. Jesus was still in the air doing the double axle when he was in the grave, but when he rose from the grave, he stuck the perfect landing when he resurrected and defeated death, defeated sin, defeated hell, and defeated the grave for us. Because scripture makes it clear that without the resurrection, we are still in our sin. Without the resurrection, his virgin birth means nothing. Uh, without the resurrection, his perfect life means nothing. Without the resurrection, his miracles don't mean a thing. Jesus nailed it when he walked from the grave with all power in his hands. In fact, we know this because Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. In fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even in Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, is worthless and you are still in your sin. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Family, without the resurrection, all of this is a waste of time. And so the reason we celebrate this, the reason we exalt his name, the reason there are tears, the reason some people are laid prostrate, the reason some people want to run laps, the reason some of you stay still and you just meditate and contemplate and think is because the resurrection reminds us of the victory that Jesus Christ has secured for us. The resurrection reminds us that despite who rejects me at the foot of the cross, I'm accepted. And so, so Luke points this out to us. Luke, who wrote uh, Luke and the book of Acts to his friend Theophilus, gives us four aspects of trust that I want us to find from this text. Number one, we can trust his way. Number two, we can trust his work. Number three, we can trust his word. And number four, we can trust his win. Luke chapter 24, verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. Here's our first point. The resurrection reminds us that we can trust his way. Uh, now, the Bible tells us, according to Luke's account, Luke, a physician, is a very detailed guy. He lets us know the first day on the Jewish calendar, which is Sunday, they don't necessarily use that term. They just call it the first day. But this is why we celebrate the resurrection and we celebrate on Sunday because it's the first day of the week. The other indication here is that Jesus, his, his body, had been in the womb for some time. Uh, but then Luke says this, they. Now, I want to know who they is. Well, Matthew lets us know uh, that the they is Mary Magdalene and, and the other Mary, the aunt of Jesus in his gospel. Uh, Mark lets us know it's them same two women, but then he adds Salome. And then here it is, Luke, uh, he, he adds uh, the wife of Chusa here. But, but here's important. One of the women here was Mary Magdalene. And in John chapter 20, I'm sorry, actually in Luke chapter 8 verse 2, we found out that this woman was possessed by seven demons. And so there's a, there's a reason that she's one of the women following closely as Jesus was crucified. She honored the Sabbath. Luke 23 lets us know that. But she's among this group of women who are going to see the body of Jesus. Now, these women had prepared some spices. The spices was an embalming oil to anoint his body. And so two things, the women are showing bravery because the men are away afraid. But also, while they are going in their bravery, there is also some doubt here because they are expecting to find the body of Jesus. But that's not their only concern. As they are walking up together, they are having a conversation saying, girl, who going to move that big rock? 
Mark chapter 16, verse 3 lets us know that they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance, uh, the entrance to the tomb for us? Uh, Luke is going to let us know what happened. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away <laughs> from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. Here's our next point. The resurrection reminds us that we can trust his finished work. Let me say that again. The resurrection reminds us that we can trust his finished work. Not only did they have to worry about a stone, uh, but Matthew's gospel lets us know that the Romans had also put a guard there because they did not want a testimony about Jesus to go out. Matthew chapter 27, verse 66 says, They went and secured the tomb by setting a seal on the stone and placing the guards. So I want you to see this. There's a stone, there's this seal, and there's a soldier. Let me say it again. There's a stone, there's a seal, and there's a soldier. First, the, the stone was designed by Joseph of Arimathea, this rich man who followed Christ. The stone was there to conserve, say conserve, conserve the body of Jesus. But the seal was put there by the enemies of Jesus and the enemies of the cross because they wanted to confine, say confine. Uh, but then the soldier was also placed there by the enemies of Jesus and the enemies of the cross because they wanted to control, say control. And so Joseph wanted to conserve. The seal was designed to confine. The soldiers are there to control because Matthew says they wanted to control the narrative just in case the body of Jesus got away. They wanted to say that someone stole his body because they wanted to defame the name of our Lord Jesus even in his death. And so Joseph wanted to conserve. The seal was designed to confine. The Roman soldiers there to control the na narrative, but our Savior wasn't there because he conquered. He was not there, so they could not confine him. They could not control him because they did not find the body because he had conquered sin, conquered hell, conquered the death, and conquered the grave. Family, the rolled away stone reminds us that we can trust his finished work. They're having a discussion about the stone, but by the time they get there, the stone had already been rolled away. You missed your shout, mama. You worried about certain things, but by the time you get there, you find out that the Lord had already worked it out. Yeah. Notice they, they found the stone. They saw it had been rolled away, but they didn't find the cornerstone. <laughs> they, they, they found the stone. But they did not find the cornerstone who is our Savior, Jesus. I don't know about you, but every now and then you're happy when you don't find something. If you go into the doctor, you're happy that they don't find a mask. Uh, when, when you go in to, get, to, get, to check out if you have a virus, you're happy that they don't find a virus. Uh, if you're uncertain about your significant other and you go through their phone, you're happy when you don't find a side leak. Every now and then, you are happy when you don't find something. And what they could not find is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they are happy that they could not find him. And so watch this. The women went up. The disciples didn't show up, but Jesus got up. He had got up out of the grave to show us his power. Verse 5. So the women were terrified. Now, see, we, we have the wrong view of angels. They are usually chubby babies with, with wings. But in the Bible, when angels showed up, people were terrified. And here's no different. They're terrified, and they ask a question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead, asked these angels in dazzling apparel. Verse 6, he is not here Say this with me. He has risen. One more time. He has risen. The angels say, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. The, the women are scared because they expected to find the body of Jesus. Instead, they find these two angels. And don't you love how the Lord can turn tragedy into triumph? Don't you love how the Lord can turn your mourning into dancing? 
Don't you know how the Lord can turn your moment that would define you for destruction, but he can refine you for his plan and his purpose? I love how the Lord can turn things here. And so they went looking to find the body of Jesus. They went looking to embalm the body of Jesus. Instead, they got more than they bargained for because Ephesians tell me that my God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything I ask or I can even think. And so they expected to find a body, but here it is. He has risen. The angels declare this. He has risen. And we have life because he has risen. And I love it because these three words speak to every situation you have encountered or will encounter. We're able to be reminded that every problem, every challenge, every obstacle you could possibly face, the resurrection, which Paul says is of first importance, reminds us that there is nothing too hard for our God. Why? Because he has risen. But family, I want to pose a question as well. The, the angels put forth a question, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And I want to ask some of you watching and some of you uh, sitting before me today, why are you looking for death when God is offering you life? Uh, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for life in dead things? Uh, why are you looking for life in dead relationships? Why are you looking for life uh, in dead things and dead ideology? So when they ask this question, here's what they're doing. It is a correction and an announcement. He's correcting the fact that they expected to find the body of Jesus. That's what these angels are declaring. But they're also announcing the truth that our God is not dead, but he is alive. These three words, family, you need to commit them to memory. When you feel like you can't get out of something, remember, he has risen. When you feel like the situation is dead, remember, he has risen. And here it is, because he has risen, you can recover from your rejection. Because he has risen, you can recover from your addiction. Because he has risen, you can recover from your isolation. Because he has risen, you can recover from your depression. Okay, because he has risen, you are accepted. Because he has risen, you are redeemed. Because he has risen, you are renewed. Because he has risen, you are chosen. Because he has risen, you are loved. Because he has risen, you have peace. Because he has risen, you have joy. Because he has risen, you have self-control. Because if the grave can be defeated, whatever you're going through can be defeated as well. Because why? He has risen. Now, 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 here it is. Jesus, I would say, saved his best miracle for last. And now, resurrection in Scripture, this is acts not something new. Jesus raised other people from the dead. The widow of Nain's, her son, in Luke chapter 7. Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8. The multitude of saints in Matthew chapter 27. Lazarus in John chapter 7. But in all four Gospels, Jesus says, watch this, I'm going to resurrect myself from the grave. And he shows us the beauty of his power that because he has risen, life and death, death is defeated and life is attained in him. Verse 7, the angels are still talking, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Number three, uh, the resurrection reminds us that we can trust his word. Let me say that again. The resurrection reminds us that we can trust his word. The, the angels reminded them of what Jesus had said. And isn't it interesting how quickly we forget when tragedy hits us? Well, when tragedy hits us, we forget our favorite scripture sometimes, don't we? Uh, well, when tragedy hits us, we, we, we're, we're normally people of faith, but we even forget to pray. Uh, we go into strategy mode instead of going into prayer mode. We have to be reminded of the word of Jesus. And so here it is. He mentions Jesus' betrayal, that Jesus was betrayed. Now watch this. Jesus was stabbed in the back by Judas. Jesus was stabbed in the front by Peter. Let me say this again. Jesus was stabbed in the back by Judas. Jesus was stabbed in the front by Peter. Here it is. He was first betrayed with a kiss. Matthew 26, 47 through 49, while he was still speaking, 
Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him. The chief priests and the elders of the people, his betrayer had given them a sign, the one I kiss, he is the one, arrest him. So immediately he went up to Jesus, said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus was betrayed and stabbed in the back by Judas. He was betrayed with a kiss, but he was also betrayed by his kinsmen. Not only was he stabbed in the back by Judas, he was stabbed in the front by Peter. Here it is, Luke chapter 22, verse 60. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. I want you to hear it again. He was stabbed in the back by Judas, but he was stabbed in the front by Peter. He was betrayed with a kiss by Judas, but he was betrayed by his own kinsmen. Isn't it interesting? Peter here forgets how Jesus came through for him every time he needed him. When Peter had a tax bill, it was Jesus that told him to catch these fish, and these fish will pay your tax bill. When Peter's mother-in-law was sick and needed healing, it was Jesus who healed Peter's mother-in-law, and she was able to continue to serve them. Every single time Peter needed Jesus, Jesus was there. But the moment Jesus needed Peter, Peter denied him three times and stabbed him in the front. But the Bible says here in Luke that Jesus turned and looked at him, but didn't bring up the mother-in-law, didn't bring up the tax bill. Aren't you glad that even when we fail him, he looks at us with compassion. He looks at us with redemption. He doesn't bring up everything we've done against him, but he receives us even though he was stabbed in the front. So he was betrayed with a kiss. He was betrayed by his kindred. But lastly, he was betrayed by his kind. Mark chapter 14, verse 55 the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could not find any. Verse 56, for many were given false testimony against him, and the testimonies did not agree. You see that? So he was betrayed with a kiss, uh, betrayed by his kindred, and betrayed by his kind, and he went through all of this. And the Bible tells us that they tried to find a testimony against him, but they could not find one. Now, I don't know about you, but if you ask just for a little bit of dirt on me, a ton of people will raise their hands. And I know you, 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 you nice and you perfect and you have it all together, but that's not my testimony. They tried to find just one person to have a testimony against the Lord, but they couldn't. So instead, they had to get false witnesses. I wonder why they didn't get the leper. The leper would have said, he touched me and healed me. Why didn't they get the woman with the issue of blood? She would have said, I touched him and I was healed. If they would have got Zacchaeus, he would have said, he visited me. Uh, the, the woman at the well would have said, he exposed and he saved me. Uh, Mary Magdalene would have said, he delivered me. Uh, the woman caught in adultery would have said, he didn't condemn me. They could have found a witness that would have said, he's been good to me. I don't know about you, but my testimony is, he delivered me. He saved me. He didn't condemn me. He didn't push me away. He accepted me. He chose not to reject me. He chose to redeem me. If I were back, then hopefully I love to believe that I would have been one of the witnesses to say, he's been good to me. They could not find one witness, but they had a ton of witnesses who would have testified about his goodness, but they chose not to talk to any of them. Verse 9, returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Look at these sisters testifying, first ones to spread the gospel, if you will, in his resurrection state. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary and mother of James and the other women. So it was even more with them telling the apostles these things. But these words, watch this, seemed like nonsense to them. And they seemed like nonsense to them. And they did not believe the women. Verse 12, Peter, however, got up. And ran to the tomb, and when he stooped to look in, he saw 
only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what happened. Family, lastly, the resurrection reminds us that we can trust his win. His win over sin, his win over death, his win over the grave. Sadly, the disciples treated these women like men who did not know the Lord. Sadly, these disciples dismiss the testimony of the women, and sadly, that was common back then. A woman could not testify in court. A woman was dismissed immediately, but I believe it was God's providence that he would use women to show that they are part of his redemptive plan. Uh, he also wants to remind us of how God uses women. In fact, the Bidi, the Bidi Anyabuele says this, the church would have closed its doors in Jerusalem if it had been up to the men going to the tomb early in the morning to prepare the body. Uh, these women went without the accompaniment of men. The men were afraid. The men were in a room, and Jesus just walked through the wall like, what's up? They were afraid, but here it is, the, the women showing courage here. But now Luke, Luke doesn't give us this detail, but in John chapter 20, verse 26, they let us know how Jesus walks through the walls. But here it is, here's the restorative power of the resurrection. For the women, the resurrection reminds us that Jesus restores the degraded. These women were degraded even though they showed courage to go and see Jesus. They did not deny him like Peter did. They were not afraid to walk up to the tomb, even though they were expecting the stone and the guard. They showed bravery here. The resurrection restores the degraded. But then the resurrection reminds us that Jesus restores those that deny him. Later in John's gospel, he lets us know that Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? And he goes through the different types of love, eventually getting to agape love. And so uh, the resurrection shows us that Jesus restores the degraded, the women, that, that Jesus restores those that deny him. So if you're watching or you're here and you've denied him or by your life you are denying him, the cross allows for restoration. But thirdly, if you know your Bible, you know there was a man by the name of Thomas who said, I ain't going to believe it uh, until I see the scars for myself. Jesus said, I accept the challenge. Jesus was the first one to pull up. <laughs> Jesus pulled up and said, see the scars. I got the scars to prove I redeemed you. I got the scars to prove I died for you. I got the scars to prove that I lived and died in your place. So lastly, the resurrection restores the degraded. It restores those that deny him, but Jesus also restores those with doubt. The women were degraded. Peter denied him. Thomas doubted him, but Jesus does not condemn. He reminds us that he restores. And so now Peter, who ran from him emotionally by denying him three times, now runs to the tomb. And in John's gospel, it's a, it's a little petty because he lets him know, I beat Peter to the tomb. But Peter actually goes in, and the Bible says all he saw was the cloth. And in John's gospel, let's just know that John sees the cloth, and then that was enough for him to believe. Because he knew that if they stole the body of Jesus, they would not have folded the cloth neatly in place. If they stole the body of Jesus, they wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap him. And so he, he believed when he sees the cloth because he recognized that if the cloth is laying there, Jesus had to take it off himself showing us his power. John's gospel gives us another detail that the other gospels don't, and that's this one word in the Greek, three words in English, where Jesus says, to telestai. To telestai means this, it is finished. Uh, if you study the seven last words in order, the sixth of Jesus' seven last words is, it is finished. Uh, the seventh is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So on the cross, Jesus says, it is finished, not I am finished, because he's just getting started. So he's letting us know it is finished. Then he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, letting us know that no one took Jesus' life. He laid down his life for us. 
He gave his life to redeem us. He says earlier, don't think that I can't snap my fingers and a legion of angels can come and wipe all y'all out. But it is finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit because I'm giving my life for them. I'm living in their place. I'm dying in their place. And I'm becoming sin for them. But I'm going to walk out this grave showing that their debt is paid in full. To tell us that is an accountant term, and it's an account term that means paid in full. But I want to know what is finished. What is finished is the crushing of the serpent's head of Genesis 3. What is finished is the prophecy of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Uh, what is finished is the standard of, per of, of perfection in John chapter 5. What is finished is the law and all of it needing to be fulfilled in Matthew 5. What is finished is the onslaught of the enemy, Ephesians 6. What is finished is his mission to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19. What is finished is our atonement, Romans chapter 3. What is finished is our resurrection, 1 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is finished because Jesus has done all the work, everything we need on the cross to redeem us. He has done it. Family, anyone knows me know I love like UFC and I love a, a good fight story. Some of y'all too young to remember this, but how many of y'all remember Rocky? Amen. Not enough hands went up, but, it, but I'm going with it anyway. Rocky V has an interesting scene. In, in Rocky V, Rocky meets a, a young buck by the name of Tommy Gunn. Uh, he, he trains Tommy Gunn. Tommy Gunn looks up to Rocky, and he decides to train him, and Tommy Gunn ends up becoming the heavyweight champ. Uh, but over time, just like we do, uh, Tommy begins to smell himself. And as he smells himself, he ends up firing Rocky and thinking that he doesn't need him anymore. But there's a scene towards the end of the movie where, where they're at this tavern, and Rocky is with his cousin, and then Tommy Gunn pulls up with this Don King lookalike. So Tommy Gunn got this blue jumpsuit on, got his name on the back that says Tommy Gunn, and he wants to challenge Rocky to a fight. And Rocky's like, nah, I don't want to do this, man. He's like, man, this, he, your promoter, man, all he's doing is using you. R Rocky's cousin walks up to Tommy Gunn and said, man, this man did everything for you. You wouldn't be in the place you are without him. And Tommy Gunn punches Rocky's cousin, knocks him on the ground. He, he gets back up, and, and Rocky says, why don't you hit me like that? Uh, they, they start a little brawl on the inside. They go outside, and, and Rocky catches him with an eight-piece. Bow, 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 bow. Then Tommy Gunn goes down. Wasn't over, though. Tommy Gunn gets back up and beats Rocky down. Beats him bad. I mean, bad, bad. Like, if World Star was back then, bad. Beats him down. R Rocky, uh, as he's down, he begins to think about Rocky one. Rocky 2, Rocky 3, and Rocky 4. He's living Rocky 5. But then there's a scene there where he remembers Mickey, his trainer. Mickey had died, but Mickey says this, get up, you, I can't say on Easter Sunday. But, but Mickey tells him to, to, to get up, and uh, he gets up, and Tommy is walking away thinking that he had secured the victory, has his back turned, thinking that the fight is over. He's walking away. But Rocky gets up and says, hey, Tommy, I didn't hear no bell. I ain't hear no bell, meaning the fight is not over. The round is not over. And when he gets back up, he knocks Tommy Gunn and he defeats him. But the reason he was able to get back up is because he remembered someone who was dead, Mickey, but in his mind he was alive. And because he remembered someone who was dead and was alive, he got back up and said, I didn't hear no bell, meaning the fight is not over. You missed it. The enemies of the cross were walking away. They thought the fight was over. They were high-fiving. They thought they had defeated my God. They thought that because he was in the tomb, the fight was over. But Jesus said, I ain't hear no bell. Popped out of the cross on the third day with all power in his hand. He resurrected. He defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the grave. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I have victory. Because he lives, I have peace. Because he lives. Why? Because he has Risen! He's alive! He defeated death, hell, 
sin and the grave. The tomb is empty. It's a wrap because our Savior has done it. So now he says, 1 Corinthians 15, when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying it is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death, oh, where is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus stuck the perfect landing with the resurrection. He nailed it, securing our salvation. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor because the tomb is empty. Father, we love you, Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. We are grateful, Father God, that we do not serve a lying Savior. We do not serve a dead Savior. We serve the way, the truth, and the life. And we are grateful that through you and only through you and because of you that we have victory. The tomb is empty. And God, Romans declares that you are at the right hand of the Father, even interceding for us now. You are in the seat of perpetual and eternal victory. So God, we love, we praise, and we thank you. Family, listen. For whatever reason you're here, you're here. Can I tell you, we're glad you're here. Typically, pastors take a shot at you. But I believe the Lord just wants to remind you that there's room at his altar and his cross. So there are people up front wanting, wanting, waiting, and willing to pray with you. Some of you, if you're honest, you're trying to find life in dead things, dead relationships, substances. God is saying, I have more for you. Would you come up and let us pray for you? We would love to pray not only for you, with you. I can promise you the man talking down and the people up front, we don't have it all together. But Jesus does. And he invites imperfect people to his altar. So I'm glad you're here. No self-righteous judgment. You're here. Praise God. So would you silence the voice of shame or guilt? Come forward. We would love to pray with you. If you don't know Jesus... And I didn't say no church. Some of you know church. You know call and response. But you don't understand his gospel. The gospel is the power of salvation. Tells us in Romans 1.16. So, Father, I pray right now. People at home or people here don't know Jesus, just say these words and Again, it's your faith. It's only your faith in Christ that saves, not the words. But the words are an act of faith. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of grace. I'm grateful and thankful that you died and you rose for me. For it is by grace and through faith in you that I am saved. Family at home, you can text commit to the words on your screen. If you trust that Christ, we would love to pray with you. I'm going to ask everyone to stand as we prepare to sing. But the altar will remain open. We would love to pray with you. If it's something I didn't mention and you desire prayer, let us pray with you. 
You never know what the Lord may do through that one act of obedience. If you just push past your fear, you push past your discomfort, you push past your pride. Let us pray with you. Father, we are grateful and thankful. In Jesus' name.